So what's the difference between being a human sensor and a human barcode? Well, I think that um, human beings are good at sensing stuff. Uh, not We don't have the um, attentiveness that machines have. Machines are really good at being diligent and sensing things. But we have judgment. We make decisions. And there's uh, a lot of systems that talk about human beings as sensors, like um, the 311 system, mm -hmm. where you ask human beings to, uh, to tell you about stuff. Um, and then there's a lot of systems where we count humans. And mm -hmm. there's nothing necessarily wrong with counting humans, especially when it's the best way to solve a technical problem. There's a lot of places where we count humans not because it's the best way to solve a problem, but because it's a way to extract something of value from them, their personal information. Um, and we say when we do that, oh, we're trading them back some service and we're making a, an even swap. I think a lot of the time that swap isn't very even. Mm. So do you think it's possible for companies, if they were so inclined, to shift from the barcode mindset to a sensor mindset? What I, what I guess I would argue is that right now, because users don't have any way to, f to resist being treated as a barcode, Right. There's no effective cookie management. Your phone leaks all kinds of personal information and so on. Um, companies will treat you like a barcode because they can do it for free. Mm. Right? They, 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 the rubric is, oh, well, we're trading service for, for, uh, for data. But really, you get, you get all that information for free. Mm -hmm. And so you know, like if you go to a web page and you, you look at all the cookies that web page is set, you know, one of them is set to give you a persistent login, and one of them is set to like, manage your preferences in the display. And then 180 of them were set to follow you around. Sure. Right? Now, the, the one that was set to give you a persistent login and the one that was set to, to, to let you comment, those ones are giving you something, mm -hmm. and the other ones aren't. So what I think it would do is it would shift the, ba the balance so that companies wouldn't treat uh, your data as though it was something that they got at no cost. They would instead have to make compelling propositions. And I think companies should welcome this, because mm -hmm. if you've got a compelling proposition, Right now, you are undifferentiated from the companies that don't. Mm. And so, you know, if you, we worry, for example, about the expansion of advertising um, uh, inventory, right? The number of the number of page impressions available, driving down the cost of of, of advertising, uh, but or, or CPMs. Mm -hmm. But what would happen if um, you didn't get a, you didn't get an impression if you if you didn't have a good website because you couldn't offer a compelling value proposition and users could fine tune their cookies. Hmm. At that point, you have a contraction in inventory because the good companies would have lots of impressions and the bad companies wouldn't generate impressions. Hmm. Interesting. So, we always hear about companies and organizations who have bad data policies. Are there any that are doing it right? Any that should be emulated? Well, I don't know about any company who's like top to tail. Sure. Strategy is great. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you one example I thought of that really gets the balance right, which is the way that Amazon handles um, some of its uh, user purchase data. So um, I'm an Amazon user. I, I buy a lot of stuff from them. And I have a lot of theories about how to sell their stuff. I think that this and this could be put together. I think if you wrote this about this and presented it in a certain way. So I can make a list. I can mm -hmm. make uh, Corey's best fat mm -hmm. beach books. Mm -hmm. I can make Corey's best tinfoil beanie ingredients. And um, that treats me like a sensor, right? Sure, I'm, a, right. I'm, I'm, I'm a person who has expertise and knows something. But you can also treat me like data. Because if I go to your list and I buy two books on the list, Amazon goes, these two books are correlated and I'm going to group them together not, as a, not specifically because they're on your list, but because your theory has been validated by data. And that treats me as, like, as, a, as both a barcode and a sensor at the right moment. Mm -hmm. It's not treating me like a barcode when I have sensor-like information to offer. And it's not asking me to sense things when I have no expertise to do so. Like that's the, the see something, say something. Sure. Right? Like, you know, dear, dear person who has no experience outside your little five block neighborhood, please evaluate everyone you see and determine whether or not they're a terrorist. Sure. Generates those outcomes where you know, there was that thing on, uh, the, in September 2001, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the month when they started the planes flying again, where two Hasidic Jews uh, caused a, a panic right. and, a, and a grounding of the plane because uh, uh, swarthy men with long beards had been, uh, had been muttering in a foreign language mm -hmm. at the back. And they'd been, they'd been dovening and saying the morning prayers. And this freaked out someone who'd never seen a Hasidic Jew. Right. You know? So uh, there are times when you don't want to treat people like like sensors because they're they're not good sensors, mm -hmm. right. and it's uh, I think that right now because barcodes come for free, we've neglected the sensor side. So last question for you: mm -hmm. the concept of data ownership right now mm -hmm. seems very murky. Yeah, right? companies are not coming out explicitly and saying we own it, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time they're not coming out explicitly and saying you own it either. 
Do you think that that's going to get worked out in the near term? I think that there's a couple of big problems with it. The, f the first problem is um, if you own your own data uh, and companies have to associate any data they gather on you with some identity package that relates to you so they can give it to you when you ask for it and audit it and so on, then they have to collect a lot of data about you. Um, and it's very hard to tell whether or not they've given you all the data that you've asked for, short of you know, really heavy duty audit. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a really tricky thing to enforce. And at the same time, I think ownership is probably the wrong metaphor for data. Uh, like take my phone number, mm -hmm. right? I have an interest in my phone number, but to say that that string of digits belongs to me is just wrong. Mm -hmm. Because then it means that like, when you publish my phone number, you've stolen from me. We have to resort to distorted property metaphors. We've already seen what happens when you distort property metaphors to, to encompass information, and you get all the weird outcomes that we've gotten in the copyright wars. You know, Expand them by a hundredfold when you start saying that there's data in it. Mm -hmm. Now, we have another model for expressing some proprietary interest in things that isn't property. And that's just the interest itself. So I have a daughter. She's not my property. Mm -hmm. I have a really strong interest in my daughter. Sure. But so do my parents, and so does society, and so does her school, and so does um, the Canadian Embassy in London. And, and lots and lots of different entities can have an interest in it. And we are accustomed to crafting policy and law to balance out those competing interests. What we don't do is say this belongs to you hmm. because it just we just get it wrong when we stick when we stick it in that metaphor. Information isn't like property. Information is like information. And um, it has some really distinctive characteristics that make property metaphors really bad in respect of it. Great. Well thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate Not at it. all, thank you.